Okay. So you all met me all you know, right after lunch. My name's Alexander Dyke. Uh, this is Anjali Sing Singhai Jane, uh, an architect with our, with, uh, well, I guess technically it's not networking division because the architecture team's separate, but yeah, architect that works with ND, uh, within Intel. And, oh, actually, where's the remote? There we go. And we're here to uh, basically discuss network I.O. virtualization, you know, its history and its future. So I just thought I'd start out with a quote. Progress, far from consisting in change, depends on retentiveness. When change is absolute, there remains no being to improve and no direction is set for possible improvement. And when experience is not retained, as among savages, infancy is perpetual. <laughs> Summarize, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. You know, we've gone through a lot of different technologies over the last few years in terms of a lot of this stuff, and it seems like we end up making a lot of the same mistakes over and over again. And so one of the goals of this presentation is to help remind some of us of some of the things we've done, the good, the bad, and hopefully um, set some, help to set some directions so that we avoid some of the same mistakes we've made in the past. So, yeah, as I said, it's going to be go over a brief evolution of network I.O. virtualization in Linux, some of the pros and cons of SRIOV, um, the future of network I.O. virtualization, uh, a comparison of a few different items, uh, some things that we're considering, and just a brief conclusion. So, evolution of network I.O. virtualization. For those um, that are probably familiar, uh, the E1000 is a NIC that, that, or a driver, that worked with older uh, Intel uh, gigabit Ethernet silicon. And when I say older, I don't know how many of you know what this is. This is an Intel, it, yeah, at this distance you can't really see it. It's an ISA card. No, it's actually a PCI card. We aren't going that old, <laughs> but it is still pretty old. You know, PCI, it, it supports one interrupt vector, um, can do gigabit mostly. As long as it's got a fast enough PCI bus, was it 66 megahertz bus instead of 33? You know, for back in its day, like you know, 10, 15 years ago, this was a pretty cool thing. And you know, when you installed it in Windows XP 64, which was the bleeding edge thing, it worked. Which you know, that's great. It works. And so, an advantage, you go and you set it up inside your VM, and you create a virtual version of this, and you can load the OS, and it works great. And then you know, for gig, that works really well. The problem is that thing was designed back when you know. Pentium was the big new processor, essentially. So it's not designed to handle multi-core. It's not designed to handle 10 gig or 40 gig or anything that's going to be, you know, really fast. It's good for installing an OS, you know. That's pretty much the full extent of it. You're not going to get the kind of speeds that you're looking for in a telco. So needless to say, you know, emulating something like this in your hypervisor yeah, it works good if you want to install an OS or do, you know, just set somebody up so they can set up, you know, access their email and such. Maybe even transfer some small files. But you're not going to put it in, you know, emulate something like that in a system that needs to handle a large, heavy workload. So, you know, that being said, of course, the thought is, well, what do we do? You know, the next virtualization or the next uh, solution ends up becoming kind of obvious. So, it's, what if we turn around and instead of emulating a device that's actual hardware? We emulate, well, yeah, something that's, you know, designed to run on the software, and that's where para-virtualization comes in. Specifically, in the history of Linux, anyway, the main one being for KVM, Vert.io. Uh, the whole design there, it's optimized for software emulation. So you can get away with a lot of little tricks in software that you wouldn't be able to get, it with, get away with otherwise. For example, when you're emulating one of these things, you can't say, okay, and uh, we're going to add LRO support. This thing doesn't know what LRO was. It was, you know, it, it was lucky to have jumbo frames back in the day. But with something like uh, Vert.io, we can say, okay, yeah, we're going to cheat a little bit. We know we're software on both sides. We don't actually have to send the packets across the network. So what we'll do, we'll report TSO on this side, LRO on this side, and when we send the packet down, we'll just hand it directly across, do a couple of big page maps and copies, and that's about it. So for stuff like east-west traffic, it looks really good. You can go set up a UDP transmit. It does 64K UDP frames right across. No fragmentation needed. Just done. It does UFO. You know? um, on the downside, though, it's still an, uh, more or less an emulated interface. So if you're doing a lot of small packets and they're at just the right rate such that you can't bulk them together, 
you're looking at having to kick into the hypervisor every time you do a send in order to, you know, to get it to actually kick off and send the packet down into the actual host network stack. You end up taking a lot of traps as a result, and then there's still the mem copy overhead for moving the packets down from the guest into the host. And so, of course, the next solution everybody went with after that, it's like, well, you know, why bother virtualizing? We'll take the real hardware and put it right in there. Which, <sighs> yeah. That works okay until you really start taking the things like, you know, security into account. You know how these VMs are running around with devices that are, have direct access to your network. So it's kind of a cross your fingers and hope you can trust the guy that you just gave the nick to. Um, but yeah, as far as performance goes, it, something like that really can't be beat. You're bypassing things, no mem copies. The only gotcha is you still have some internet, or not, some interrupt overhead as the host still has to notify the guests that, oh, hey, you have an interrupt now. But even that's, you know, to some extent, now that we've got the next generation of IOMMUs coming out that can do things like uh, IOA pick inside the guests, to some extent, even that's been mitigated. And so then we start getting into, actually, I set this down to pick that up. Uh, and then we start getting into SRIOV, which, you know, right off the bat, uh, to some extent, the initial idea with SRIOV is yeah, we can't take a system, shove it full of 40 NICs, and then hand them all out. You, that's just not going to scale at all. I've actually seen systems like that where it's like you get to the point where you've got so many NICs in the system, there's just resources that aren't showing up just because you're out of like buses and whatnot. It just it starts to get kind of silly trying to do something like that. And so the idea with SRIOB is you can take one physical function and partition it into multiple, multiple virtual functions. So the way, in addition, the big thing you get with uh, SRIOV versus uh, just a physically assigned function is you have sort of an intermediary. Um, normally, this ends up being the PF, the physical function, can act as an, interme in, an intermediary between the VF and the host. So if he asks for something that seems wrong, you can deny it. So if he decides to add a MAC address you don't like, you can deny it because usually that BF is having to ask the physical function for permission to take the various actions that it's taking. Um, in addition, uh, we still get the added security, so you can't actually write memory to anywhere where you're not supposed to because the IOMMU is still in play. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and so like I mentioned, there's also some control plane separation. Now you don't have one physical NIC, so the, the PF can control things so that the VF doesn't have full control. Um, with a setup like this, you end up getting high packet rate. Uh, low CPU utilization and low latency thanks to the fact that it's all direct pass through, no copy. It, when the VF hits that doorbell, it, it should be just hitting that doorbell assuming there's no extra traps or anything in the way there. And so it'll just go. The packets will move as fast as possible. And then as far as some of the issues, um, the biggest one is probably just the fact that SRIOV is very inflexible. Um, most designs if you support SRIOV, you get to support, you know, n times whatever you enable. And my advice is you probably only ever want to hit that enable once. Because if you're having to change the number of VFs you have, you have to rip everything down and rebuild it from the ground up, at least in the case of the Intel parts. Because you're having to create brand new PCI functions on the bus, you're having to change resource allocations, rings, vectors, etc. And that gets to be very expensive. So it's not something like, oh, you know, it's not something you can spin up on demand just because, oh, I have a new VM, I want a new VF. Because at that point, you're having to like reset the whole server, tear down your VMs, and rebuild them all. Um, let's see. And then, yeah, as far as the rest of it, so we have some uh, other scalability issues that still come up, although it's not as bad. Uh, bus device function number limits, you know, in theory, in the future, Somebody might want to have something like 64,000 VMs, theoretically. There's no way we could support that with existing bus device function numbers. Um, another issue is SRIOB forces uh, a lot of switching features into the NIC that can make it more difficult to actually see and debug what's going on. So with like OVS or Bridge, we could actually, you know, just uh, <clears throat> uh, go promiscuous mode and analyze some of the ports. With uh, SRIOV, you lose that functionality just because everything's bypassing you. If traffic goes to a VF, it goes to the VF and it bypasses the PF, and he has no way to get any visibility into that. And uh, yeah, and thus everything in terms of the switching ends up becoming it's either all in the hardware or nothing. 
Um, it gets much harder to manage things when uh, you enable this. Uh, for example, just a year ago, I was having to fix the fact that promiscuous mode for VLANs even, you know, didn't really work in the Intel hardware uh, when this was all enabled, because it took a little bit of uh, rearranging to get that all up and running. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Anjali to discuss uh, the switching. Thanks, Alex. Okay, so uh, Alex started uh, with, uh, you know, describing the cons for SRIV, and one of them, uh, as we saw, was, um, you know, a lot of switching stuff uh, eventually ended up in the NIC, thanks to supporting SRIV. SRIV being a PCIe spec, it started, you know, just uh, looking like, oh yeah, we can do this in networking and, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get network I virtualization when you actually get to the bottom of it, you've actually ended up creating a switch right there in the NIC. And that's <coughs> what happened. And, and, and uh, you know, the, one of the problems that uh, Alex just mentioned about the VLAN uh, promiscuous stuff, all those things, um, since it gradually happened that once you start doing this, you realize, oh, if you wanted to do something like what you can do on your, uh, you know, the uh, uh, PF interface, you want to do the same thing on the VF interface, now you have replicated all of those functionality of creator switch there. Uh, this one? Okay. Okay, so just a quick glance on the switching features that ended up in the hardware uh, with SRV support. Uh, we started with uh, some basic Mac filtering, Mac-based switching, and then slowly um, do more and more complete switch features. Um, uh, some of this, um, you know, started in the first version of SRV with anti-spoof support, which is actually a basic ACL for the VF if you look at it from the hardware perspective. Um, you know, something very uh, commonly done using TCAMs and hardwares. Um, VLAN filtering, switching, pruning, uh, port VLANs, um, and then you add all the L3, L4 forwarding rules, drop rules. Um, if you see this whole list, you're building a switch there. Um, the broadcast multicast replication, you know, it got really, really crazy in there. Um, and, and, and it, so there was a point that Shurjit mentioned in a keynote uh, this morning, and he said um, all these devices are, uh, you know, they should have a common software um, APIs on top to manage. Uh, and it makes a whole lot sense because these devices are looking a whole lot similar too. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I have kind of put together this whole list where some of these things are still kind of uh, evolving and happening, but they're all coming from two perspectives. Some of the Tor features getting pulled into the NIC, whereas, or, and some of the software switch features getting pulled into the NIC because now you have passed through, through SRIV. So all of that has to happen in hardware unless you have a really good software model which kind of splits uh, you know, the slow path, the control plane, and data plane into three different problems and addresses only one in your pass through. Okay, so um, so uh, what is it that we want to do in future learning from our past, um, and what is going on, uh, you know, the in progress enhancements? Uh, last uh, NetDev, we talked about the adaptive virtual function driver, which is still uh, one of the things that uh, you know we're going to carry forward because we did realize a VM that is getting a pass through should not be having a new VF driver with every different device or every different vendor for that matter because that's now not how it is supposed to be. Um, it should still look like a, you know, Ethernet driver which is accelerated and, you know, um, e there is no reason that if you have offloaded all these switch features in your hardware that your VF driver should be changing. Um, uh, the live migration with SRV, it's, it's a problem that we are trying to you know, uh, solve, um, or maybe if uh, we look forward and if SRV is not the right, um, you know, rigid model uh, that works for us, maybe we solve it a different way. Um, para virtualized, so I mean, you know, that, that's where we lead into a couple of alternate solutions where we take the goodness of SRV but take away the rigidness of SRV, which came with the, it being a PCI spec. 
So yeah, this is uh, the slide from the past, uh, past NetDev, where we, um, you know, talked about uh, adaptive virtual function. Um, the, you know, uh, as I just mentioned, the VF driver has uh, no business in being so tied down to the hardware or the hardware generation um, that you know it is, uh, you know, rendered um, useless as soon as you upgrade your hardware. So. Same driver, it should always be able to do um, your basic functionality, which is networking, and then you, if you wanted something fancy, you negotiate and negotiate in a device-independent way. Um, this model looks really good to cloud customers, so we'll keep going with it. Um, you know, going f forward, um, I kind of uh, was trying to put together this picture, and I may not have done uh, a whole lot of justice to it, but I'll try to describe it. So um, on the right side, uh, you know, the green block, which is your pass-through SRV model, which is backed by a, um, uh, you know, a device, uh, uh, you know, I'm calling it a common device or SRV device, whatever, which your uh, NIC uh, implements, which is backed by a PCI config space that, uh, you know, uh, the NIC uh, helps create. Um, and and uh, this is your fastest east uh, northwest um, uh, you know traffic solution. Of course, um, you know as um, Alex was mentioning, um, if you look at uh, you know the pair virtualized solution from you know Vertio and stuff, it did just really good with east west traffic. Um, you start doing that on SRV, you're eating up on your north south bandwidth in the PCI space. Um, uh, in your PCI bandwidth. And, and uh, not to mention, you know, your PCI config space explosion done by SRV down there, um, which uh, may be an artificially uh, constrained, um, uh, constraint uh, that we inherited from SRV. Uh, as we move towards uh, uh, the left, uh, you know, the red block, most devices, hardware devices, um, you know, uh, either um, uh, as they evolve because of SRV, they have um, resources that can be partitioned and, um, uh, and they can be partitioned independent of they being SRV backed or not. Um, you know, uh, so most devices will provide multiple RSS domains. They will provide, uh, 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 you know, um, a ton of queues, of course, and and these resources, which are necessarily uh, are necessary for the fast path, um, you know, data plane, um, they can be, um, uh, you know, used for acceleration, uh, independent of SRV, um, and that's what the red model is, where you have um, um, the same driver running in the VM which was running for your pass through. Uh, so you still have the common driver front end, but you have a common device back end, uh, which is your, in your emulated uh, kernel model. Um, and, but then if you use your hardware resources to accelerate that back end, you almost have achieved uh, the same kind of performance you can with this RIV. Uh, okay, more issues. Yeah. More issues. I, I'm good at listing all the issues. So. Um, so, yeah, one of the big issues that's actually been coming up quite a bit lately, um, the issue of live migration with SRIOV. Um, for those that aren't familiar with the issue, it's essentially that right now, last I knew, if you have an SRIOV device a direct assigned to a guest, that guest can't move. Um, the issue being that there's no way to know the full state of the memory in the system because the device can change it at any second is what it comes down to. So when you start a migration, the, the guest has no way of knowing, uh, or actually the host has no way of knowing what pages in the guest were dirtied by the device or not. Um, now this may be fixed some other means in the future, um, but there's a, there was a patch set that was submitted like a year or so back, um, and I actually pointed out that there's a few issues with it. Um, the big one, there's a couple of big ones though. So the biggest issue is just that dirty page tracking. There has to be a way for the host to know what pages are DMA mapped and writable by the device. Without having that, basically migration can't happen because it'll, the, the, the host 
will migrate those pages, they'll be marked as clean, and they might get written to again by the device, which would completely invalidate the state of that memory, and there's no way for the host to know that that happened. Um, I've proposed some stuff in the past, like trying to do like a pair of virtual IOMMU. The problem is there's going to be obvious at cost to trying to do anything that would make it migratable. So there's a lot of trade-offs. There's still a lot of work to be done on that. So it's really in the early stages of still even understanding how to solve this problem. Um, but then there's a couple other things that go on. So when you're migrating a VM, um, one of the things that'll happen is, well, the address is going to move from one host to another one. So if you're running SRIOV, those packets are still arriving to the VF, and they're just going to basically die there. Or worse yet, they arrive at, at the NIC, and the NIC has already removed that filter, and it just drops the packet. So now you've got packets that are just disappearing. And so to some extent, you end up needing to put something in the PF or maybe on a bridge on the PF so that you could then uh, redirect traffic for that VF to that entity and have it hairpin and uh, send the packets back out while the switch is try well, while the network is still trying to figure out, oh, why did that MAC address m just move across the network? Um, and the last bit in all this is try to minimize the drop packet rate. So like the existing solution that's out there right now for this is if you want to migrate, you have to have like the VF bonded with like a vert IO interface. And as soon as you're going to migrate, you have uh, just hot plug remove the uh, VF from the network. The problem is at that point, all of a sudden, all the utilization and everything on the system goes way up. Um, it gives you a, a lower drop packet rate, but you still have to wait until the migration is finished and you're going to have packets dropping in the meantime. Actually, I can't, guess I kind of covered the solution there, so is there another? Here it is. Sorry. Yeah. Here. OK. So yeah, I mean, there, there isn't a clean solution here. Uh, there is a hardware agnostic solution, which uh, is what Alex was talking about, the integrated uh, teaming in software using uh, an emulated interface bonded uh, with a, you know, a pass-through interface. Uh, this, is, this is a solution that uh, you know, Microsoft does it for their you know, um, VMs. Um, so in this case, your, you know, your uh, you know, dirty page tracking is uh, done by PML and um, uh, you have, uh, because you're failing over to emulated path, um, you know, um, you are uh, free of all the SRIV issues, which is, you know, if, if you were uh, using SRIV for doing um, uh, live migration, you, you ha without actually having the steaming solution, you have to build some more hardware pieces down there. Um, uh, so, I mean, there are two possible solutions, again, in, in the hardware solutions. If we were not to do integrated teaming um, for live migration, um, you could wait for the platform level solution to come where I mean tracking dirty pages will track both ways, like the pages which are dirtied by the CPU and by the device. Once you can track those dirty pages dirtied by the device, then you know you can uh, you can have a, a live migra migration solution. Or you could uh, do a NIC-based solution where every NIC kind of does a similar thing, which it is, which a platform would have done uh, for all DMA devices, which were writing um, into memory and tracking the dirty pages. Now, NIC, every NIC vendor does their own solution for, for it. Uh, it's not a clean solution. Uh, you know, we, we kind of listed whole, you know, a lot of detail over there. Uh, the point here is, um, if uh, you know we stick to the SRIV model, there is a lot more uh, you know uh, things that we have to solve, particularly in case of live migration. Um, uh, either using you know uh, platform platform level solution or NIC level solution. Although if we were to solve this in software, we can have a solution now, um, which means a VF driver change. You have an integrated teaming driver there, uh, which, um, which seems like you know, the only reasonable solution without a hardware um, update. OK, so which leads to the next um, you know, um, topic. Uh, now that we have done all the bashing for SRV and all the issues, so this is, this is what we look uh, as what would happen in future based on um, you know, all the issues that we see. Uh, 
most devices, uh, you know, they, they would like to, um, uh, you know, break free of the limitations that Asahi brought, brought, which is uh, the PCI spec limitation. So if you could fabricate your PCI device uh, for the VM and it is not visible in your, um, in your uh, hypervisor, you're not eating into the uh, config space over there, and then you have a lot more control of all the VF devices that you uh, create for your VMs. Um, uh, they, they become a lot more composable because uh, you're, you're taking only the pieces that um, are needed for the data plane, and the rest of it can be done in software. So it's, it's like a combined device, which is you have left the pieces which can be done uh, more in a device-independent way um, in the software and the slow path pieces in the software. So yeah, your control plane, your slow path remains in the hypervisor, whereas only you get your, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the fast path cues um, uh, which get composed as a VF device and exposed to your VM. So, um, yeah, so basically by doing that, we avoid uh, too much pass-through uh, and, and solve the three, three uh, areas in, uh, in the right places. This is uh, more uh, hypothetical. Uh, there, you know, it, it's not data-backed, so don't blame me for it. Uh, it's, it's more of um, saying that if you, and this is mostly talking about uh, north-south traffic, it's not east-west traffic. So if you're using Word.io without pass-through, yes, you have uh, a degradation performance. If you were to accelerate Word.io through all the possible things that we talked about today, today which were, you know, use AF packet, use, uh, you know, uh, virtual descriptor rings, uh, use XDP to kind of uh, take your packet uh, directly to your VF, uh, uh, you know, at, at the back end, uh, uh, there are, there's a whole lot of possibilities that you can do to kind of uh, uh, reduce that uh, last mile from the packet being received in your, uh, in your um, uh, PF to going uh, to your VF um, without doing SRIV. So, uh, yes, that, that green oval can uh, move quite up based on how much acceleration we do and how much of uh, cleanup we do in our kernel stack for it. Uh, the, you know, the, the SRIV one we know, since it's a direct pass-through, it gives you the best performance. Um, the goal for composable VFs will be to retain all the goodness of SRIV for which we get through pass-through, which is your north-south traffic being uh, as fast as it can be. But, uh, so the performance should remain as good as SRIV, uh, but it should take away the rigidness. Uh, that was the idea. Uh, the, this, the slide can be looked the other way, where uh, you know, if you were talking CPU utilization, SRV and composable VFs will be way at the bottom, whereas the others will be on top. Uh, other points of comparison. Um, uh, I, I, I think uh, we talked about, um, uh, during the day we talked a lot about where should the innovation be, and uh, innovation should remain uh, buried down there in the lowest level, and it should not be exposed uh, to the you know software APIs which are using uh, these devices. To uh, at that level, it should all look very um, uh, similar, uh, and you know it should use the same kind of tools. It should uh, uh, you know work seamlessly. So the and and the hardware implementation should remain flexible enough for innovation. Uh, that was the point. Um, uh, offloads that require driver changes versus the ones that don't, and I kind of touched on that point, that, uh, you know, last few years we saw the VF driver changing a whole lot. There shouldn't be a reason for that. Uh, if, if we were doing this, you know, the switch model for uh, network I/O virtualization where we have a switch type kind of managing the SRV devices and the other, then this should be invisible um, uh, for most part in the VF driver, uh, unless um, you're creating, um, you know, uh, multiple control domains, which can happen where your VF uh, could be one of those network fu function virtualization VFs, which is trying to do a lot more than a simple VF. 
Uh, and, and, and in that case, you are actually partitioning your hardware into multiple control domains and multiple, uh, you know, you, you are dedicating uh, a whole lot of uh, switch resources to your VM, and, and that, that would be the only reason why you, sh you should ever be uh, considering your VF driver uh, changing. Uh, we touched a little bit about the east-west traffic. SRV doesn't have a solution for it, um, and that's why a mixed mo model with composable VFs will, um, it will be a better model. Um, and uh, overall cost of maintenance, I guess this is, is a really good question. Uh, a cost in terms of, uh, um, you know, um, the end user, how, uh, you know, user experience versus um, you know, we can probably argue about that a whole lot. Um, uh, and for conclusions. Yeah. So we're already over time, so I'll keep this short. Um, big issues with SRIOV. Uh, we can't migrate, and east-west traffic really hurts on it. Um, so we should need to look at doing more to try to actually get less traffic to go across that interface if possible. Um, and to that end, one of the things we're suggesting is basically we need to look at doing a combo, basically. In most cases, you probably need to have VertIO for your east-west traffic, SRIOV for your north-south traffic, and you would probably get the best of both worlds in that case. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, so uh, switch dev model, the switch dev model works for the SRIOV control plane, but you know there, there's some things going on there, although I don't know if there's really much of a, a scaling issue. We'll have to see over time. The biggest issue is going to be what happens if you know we start adding more and more ports, especially when we start looking at you know theoretical upper limits. Um, the last one was uh, yeah, basically it gets back to the with with VertIO being accelerated, there's a lot more we can do. So if we're using something like XTP or AF packet, which John mentioned, we can look at solving some of the vir uh, virtualization bottleneck for the VertIO, and that should help to improve things quite a bit. And just some acknowledgments. So yeah, I know a few of the people are here, Kieran, Mitch, John. Uh, yeah, I think that's the list. So yeah, well yeah, I said Kieran. So Kieran, Mitch, John, yeah, and then Dan Daly, Leon, uh, Nirov. I don't think are here. So, and then yeah, questions. So in my experience, the worst part about SRV is something you didn't mention, which is only about ten percent of the hardware platforms I run into will run it cleanly out of the box unless you get, you know, top shelf hardware. Um, I, and it's, luckily it's better in Linux than any of the other operating systems. The worst being VMware, which doesn't tell you anything. Uh, and Windows, you there's a bunch of PowerShell commands that will tell you, oh, your box has got this wart, I can't do anything. Um, <laughs> Well, see, there's your problem. You're not running Linux. Come on. Yeah, but with Linux, with Linux, you can at least get a demessage log or something that tells you that that this is that your these two devices overlap or whatever is going on. Well, to give you some background, like you know, for those that don't know, I was one of the ones that had to work on the first few uh, VF drivers. It got to the point where I could take a system that didn't support S or IOV, didn't support any of it, and I knew enough workarounds. I could just turn them all on and. OK, this is an old, uh, old like, uh, ICH9 right. platform. Had no support for any of that, and I could turn it all on. Although I had some of the uh, other developers yelling at me for things, because like, you know, we got into an argument about whether or not SRIOV actually required an IOMMU or not. So I'm like, why? I'm testing it on my ICH9. It doesn't have an IOMMU. It's bare metal. What are you talking about? And this is before like, containerization had really caught on, because yeah. in their mind, SRIOV was only ever going to be pushed into a VM. And it's like, you know. So those are the kind of things, you know, don't narrow things down too much, but at the same time, we need to think about stuff like migration in the future. And actually, when we introduce something, test all the cases, not just north-south. Because it's kind of embarrassing now to go and show a customer, oh yeah, we can do this VM to VM. And then they move the two VMs onto the same host, and it's like, yeah, um, you're gonna get like 40 gig on VertIO, and we're gonna do maybe 10, 15. And it's like, OK, why is that? And it's like, well, because it's just straight memory. There's this PCI bus thing, and it's bottlenecking yeah. us. It can only go so fast, so. Yeah, and, and to the same point, uh, right, like SRAV started as a PCI spec. 
the switching features came eventually when you realize that, oh, you migrate this flow down there, and now, oh, we have to have some more hardware blocks to kind of deal with it. Uh, plus, uh, in the infancy, all the SRV drivers were so device dependent. Oh yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, that, that's those are the problems we are trying to solve. Anybody else? I've got Tom over here. So, um, now that you brought it up, and I was thinking about this during your talk, but um, since there was so much depth on the VMs and the VFs and what have you. How much of this actually is applicable to a container's environment? Just depends on how it's going to be used. So that's the thing is I think, uh, what is it? Uh, Mellanox was presenting a solution that essentially ends up giving you something, uh, was it was a hardware accelerated Mac VLAN with switch dev support, if I remember right? Yeah. Um, the advantage with containers is you can get away with stuff like that. So you can actually control the granularity much better. And that gets kind of back to that idea of composable VFs. Because then you're just taking resources out of the PF and you say, okay, I can actually hand this off if I need to. Um, it just depends on what level of security you want because then you don't, you know, you don't get uh, the IOMMU isolation necessarily. But that's something that, you know, we'll probably have something like that in the future. I don't know. We'll have to see. So, so when you see this in deployment, are a lot of people using it with containers? Because this thing that I'm thinking of is if I have an opportunity to do something in software instead of hardware and it's like 99% as efficient in software, I'd al almost always rather do it in software. So right. I understand VMs why you're kind of forced into this SREV model. Well, see, that's the thing is it depends on what you're doing. North-south traffic, as long as you're heading out of the box, SREV will outperform. But if you're going east-west, we can't compete because we're bottlenecked by the PCI bus or PCIe bus because so it can only handle so much. So it's like a by 8 so like on an 82599, for instance, it's a by 8 Gen 2. So that gives you, I'm trying to remember the exact number now. Um, it's like, I think, 30 gigs, something like that, uh, of throughput max, if, if you go over that. Whereas you can do like 40, 50 gig just going around locally on the system because it's just a memory to memory transfer instead. So like I've, I've seen some pretty weird setups where people start looping things in and out of VFs. And it's like, whoa, don't do that, please. How can you accept that? Because it's like by the time they're done, they've cut like their 10 or 40 gig link down to like just single gigabit numbers because they're having to make so many trips over the PCIe bus. But if you're doing this, like what the Melonix guys were saying, Mac VLAN exposed, push, put it into a container. Well, that would still yeah, have so some of the same. You're not crossing the PCIe bus. Right, it, it'll, it would probably have some of the same kind of issues, but in theory, so like one thing we've been like batting around the idea of was essentially the, the add a bird IO channel to something like your VF. And then it, as long as you have a Mac table that says, hey, that guy's actually local to the vert IO, send it that way instead, then you could actually get the best of both worlds. Because you'd end up doing like a, almost a Mac-based routing setup. So all the local VMs would be using vert IO and everything north-south would be going SRIOV. You know, right. It wouldn't be too surprising if it's kind of like the, the thing that they do in Hyper-V at this point, where they bond the two together under one channel. Yes, yeah, so just to add some more, you know, John had done, done the Mac VLAN uh, stuff for IHGB, and that's pretty much what the para virtualized model is with hardware acceleration, right? So to answer, that's your model for container if you don't need security. If you need security, SRV is the, the model, but unless S we come up with something else with composable VS. SRV is limited, right? How many, how many SRVs? Uh, uh, SRV, one, uh, oh, it, uh, I mean, the spec itself will give you... Uh, it depends on the hardware. Yeah, it um, you can the actually hardware. go pretty big, but most of them, you can only partition into so many slices. Like, I think most of the Intel parts are like around 64. Oh, okay. There you uh, go. So you know, I thought you will do like 128. VS. 128. The bit yeah. number is, is a problem, right? There's only eight, six, seven, eight bits. So. Well, so eight. Well, eight, eight, eight in the device, yeah. or the, the function number portion, or right, no, the device and function number is eight. But theoretically, you can go beyond that. It just kind of gets hairier, because you start showing, your device has to support some extra PCI uh, okay. configuring just, options. Just to clarify, when you're saying, if, if you don't care about security, you're talking about the IO MMU? Yes, or? right. Yes. OK. Because that's, uh, you, you, that, that, it, it basically, right now, it operates on a uh, PCI function by PCI function basis. So you have no way of telling, you know, the rest of the system can access this, the rest, and only that one Q pair can access that. We're just going to cut it off here, guys. Oh, all right, Tom has, Tom, hardware is always faster. We don't, we don't have to, like, hold on. Yeah. Okay, I, I got to follow up, because 
you mentioned the other thing I was thinking about. Um, so the use of the term security here, I'm not exactly sure what that means, because if I was a user and, and you told me this was secure, that would have to mean end to end. And I think there was some offhand comment that there was crypto offload. But what exactly does that mean? So I understand the security okay, in well, terms of okay. isolation of the hardware. Well, so, yeah, security, yeah. that's basically what we're talking about with this. It's just isolation of the hardware. Yeah. Okay. So basically, a VF, if it decides to write a, like a malform descriptor, uh, at least on most of the Intel hardware, um, it'll catch that and say, OK, this guy tried to do something bad. I'm just switching him off for now. Versus like if you did uh, like a direct assign of give it a physical port, it'd just plow right through, hang the nick, and call it a day. Okay, wh what about the crypto offload comment? So the, the, the crypto offload is uh, different, of course. Uh, that's, that is coming from where you have a, a complete pass-through using SRV. So you say you uh, were having a flow which was you know, encrypted, and now you are you know, IPsec or whatever you have you. In, in the hardware, though. That's uh, what you're so it, if it was happening in the software, as soon as you pull that flow and you're doing a pass-through into SRV, you have to do the crypto down there if you want to get the benefits of TSO and stuff like that. So that, that was the comment about uh, crypto being in the hardware and then uh, you know, other protocols. When, when you're doing a pass-through and you're creating like an infrastructure, infrastructure level security, it will all have to happen in the hardware, where, where your VM is getting a packet which is already decrypted and handed over. But does it, does it actually happen? I'd be impressed. Yeah, it would have to basically uh, act like a bump in uh, the wire. Should we allow the gentleman to ask a question or Oh, come on. We talked about Vert.io. How can we not let Michael get a chance uh, to? Should I give him a chance? OK. All right. You can, you, what, you can say something. Yeah, my question would be like a bunch of issues that you discussed, like this, this fixed, uh, fixed assignment of resources, that the issues that we have with VF, um, and stuff like that. So do, do you really have to throw out all of, all of SRIV? To get that, maybe maybe you could add, you know, in the PCI spec, new capabilities that it let you add and remove the functions on dynamically, because there are some advantages. Like SRV at least is a spec, so it 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 lets us find out. Okay, this is where this this is safe to access. This is where how you reset this thing. Well, so like the, one of the issues with the PCI, well, with yeah, essentially with the way the PCIe spec for SRV is set up is you can go to a number or a non-zero value or you can go to a zero value. So if you want to take, take your number of like VFs from four to five. Sorry. Well, he's saying fix the PCI spec, which, yeah. Or get away from it. It's very easy to well, fix yeah, the PCI. Well, you can compromise it to some, or compromise with it to some extent. All right, so. guys. It, we got a few minutes before pizza, so I'm going to cut it off here. Let's give them a round of applause. I thought the pizza wasn't going to be here till 8. Yeah.